the jungle is older than man. It is pushed back to make way for his creations, but it is never conquered. The jungle is silently waiting its moment to repossess. What the jungle has buried, man is slow to disinter. But in the tangled undergrowth of Southeast Asia, where the lengths was the only dwelling, Cambodian bushmen came to hack the shroud of vegetation from a mystery five centuries old. Was the strange report in 1860 by the French naturalist Henri Mouault to be believed? Was it true that here lay remains of a fabulous shrine, a vast city, It was true. Here was the crumbling skeleton of a lost civilization. When had it been built? Why had it been abandoned to the beasts and the banyan trees? And above all, who were the forgotten people that had inhabited it? The Cambodians did not know. Legendary giants, some thought. The gods, others said. In 1907, Archaeologists from France, like Henri Marchal, came to help solve the intriguing historical riddle. One by one, the scrambled stones of the dead city were cleaned and studied. The stones had originally been ground to fit together without mortar. Apart from this, the Cambodians followed what must have been the methods of the original builders as they carefully raised them back into place. Thus began the painstaking labor of resurrection. As the task proceeded, stone by stone, so the astonishing story was pieced together. Early Chinese chronicles told of visits to the empire of the Khmers, a dominant power in Southeast Asia from the 9th to the 15th century and of the splendor of its capital, Angkor. The Khmers were ruled by a dynasty of god kings associated with the ancient Hindu divinities Shiva and Vishnu. Some 600 monuments representing the flowering of a culture that had taken a thousand years to develop solemnly attest the superb artistic achievements of the Khmers. Through the city's majestic gates, elephant caravans had once paraded with troops of torch-bearing attendants and hundreds of garlanded palace girls marching and dancing amid banners and music as the people crowded about to see their god king. Life-size tapestries in stone testify that all of this happened. All of it is true. On the walls of the temples, inscriptions record that the Khmer people lived, that their pageantry was brilliant, that their kings were greater and wiser than any on earth. 
It is all here, written in stone. Merchant adventurers from India, crossing the ocean to Southeast Asia in the centuries before the Christian era, had founded the kingdoms that preceded Angkor. Angkor itself was established in the 9th century AD. The surrounding territory was soon unified, and the power of the Khmer kings gradually extended over the entire region. For 600 years, under a succession of over 30 rulers, and where five sovereign states may be found today, the empire of the Khmers flourished in opulence that resounded throughout the Eastern world. Here they shaped the fragile vessel of civilization, pushing back the jungle to create the artistic wonders of the Orient in the temples and monuments of their capital, Angkor. No less remarkable were their feats of hydraulic engineering, which threaded the country with a coordinated network of canals and reservoirs. Angkor's buildings are regarded as one of the greatest architectural achievements of man ever concentrated in a single locality. With an area about that of Manhattan or the city of London, it was a metropolis of unparalleled splendor, a city unsurpassed in all history. Its supreme masterpiece was Angkor Wat, the city temple. Built in the 12th century, it is a contemporary of Lincoln Cathedral in England and Notre Dame in Paris. But it is more ambitious than these. Angkor Wat is said to be the finest religious building in the East and the largest ever constructed by man. On the walls of the temples, Angkor's artists set down details of everyday life. Here are the Khmers, baking bricks, cooking their food, quarrying stone, This is the way they lived, pondering over their parlor games, matching their dogs and gamecocks to fight. Kneeling to kiss the hand of their ruler. Here you may see them casting their nets for fish, performing carnival feats of juggling and acrobatics charming the senses with music and dancing in honor of their gods. This is what they did. This is how it was. Inside their temples, Buddha and the Indian trinity of Brahma the creator, Vishnu the preserver, and Shiva the destroyer smiled enigmatically. Inscribed on this massive foot of more than a hundred drawings represent canons of their faith. Above the temples, Images of the god king Jayavarman VII gaze in all directions. Angkor's most powerful ruler, he expanded his empire to its farthest reaches and made its capital a fortress of awesome magnificence. But neither gods nor kings saved the people of Angkor. On the temple walls, something of their story can be read. Proficient in building, the Khmers had been no less proud and skillful in the arts of destruction. Their armies had triumphed over all the neighboring states. They were invincible until at last 
the tide turned against them. What caused their downfall? Was it the orgy of building and pageantry that exhausted the people's energies? Was it a resurgence in the strength of their neighbors? Was it a spiritual decline through loss of faith in their traditional gods? No one is sure. But finally, Angkor itself was sacked and plundered. Its people fled, never to return. Their civilization died. The jungle advanced to bury their achievements. Why did they not return? How could they allow so much to perish? These are the final mysteries of Angkor. Its stones cannot speak of what they have known, of a metropolis superior in its time, perhaps, and more widely celebrated than our Paris or New York today. But they have meaning for all men and all ages. The word Angkor means city. The city of Angkor is a monument to the grandeur and the frailty of civilization.